Well, good afternoon, everyone. So, can you hear me? Um, welcome to the 27th Annual Presidential Faculty Lecture, The Trade-Offs of Trade, Lessons from 30 Years of Policy Reforms in Developing Countries. Our presenter this year is Nina Pouchnik, an economist of unique insight whose work has significantly raised Dartmouth's profile in the area of international trade and industrial organization while she's remained passionately, passionately committed to engaging her students in and out of the classroom as the Nyhaus Family Professor of International Studies and Professor of Economics. Nina Pauchnik was born in Yugoslavia in the region that would later become Slovenia, her family living right along the border with Italy. And Nina says this vantage gave her a compelling insight in the to the disparities between the two countries and the two economies in very human terms. She says that when she later discovered economics, she realized the field provided a framework in which to better understand these disparities and how such inequities arise. After receiving a BA in economics from Yale in 1994 and her PhD in economics from Princeton, in 1999, much of Nina's career has been spent pursuing this fundamental question of how neighboring countries can be seemingly worlds apart economically. And along the way, she has produced path-breaking research in international trade and empirical industrial organization. In fact, Nina calls her proudest piece of research a collaboration with Eric Edmonds, who serves as Dartmouth's Chair of International Studies. Their joint study examined the consequences of globalization on child labor and challenged the common perception that trade with poor countries increases child labor. Nina and Eric found that a family's decision to send a child to work instead of school hinges more on the household income than the state's demand for labor. The takeaway being that trade could actually reduce child labor if it raises the standard of living. The implications here are profound as their findings indicate an update of current theories of international trade policy as well as changes to methods to end underage labor. Highly regarded nationally and internationally, Nina's expertise has been sought out by groups such as the National Science Foundation and the World Bank. Her colleague, Douglas Irwin, has noted that, and I quote, if anyone in the world is interested in how globalization has affected workers in developing countries or how global competition affects productivity, the first place they look is at Nina Pouchnik's work. Not only is she a tremendous resource for uh, economists and policymakers the world over, Nina is most accessible to her students. And I'm told that despite a busy schedule, she is most frequently found in her office enthusiastically explaining trade mechanisms to her econ students, a teacher scholar in the finest tradition at Dartmouth. I read a, recently a quote of Nina's which speaks to this commitment and it seems well suited to framing our discussion this afternoon. She said, and again I quote, wherever you live in a large country like the US or a small country like Slovenia, it's important to know how the interactions of your country with the rest of the world affect decisions of households, firms, and governments. My hope is that students become more educated citizens of the world because no matter what path they choose to take later on, they will very likely work in a setting where they have to think about economic interactions with other countries. Her insights are as compelling as they are influential, and we are so pleased to have her share them with us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nina Pouchnik. I also actually just want to give a shout out to my, uh, shout out to my family, um, Ella, Mia, and Eric. Thank you for uh, wonderful support. Um, it's, um, yeah, I'm very lucky to have you all. Um, 
So um, as uh, President Hanlon mentioned, I grew up on the border uh, between um, Yugoslavia, and, uh, then Yugoslavia, or now Slovenia, and Italy. And just to show you, you know, how close to the border I live, this is the border. And basically this border divided a town uh, that was prior to World War II, just a town in the same country, at that time Italy, into the Italian part and into the Yugoslav part. And I lived right around there, probably like 300 meters from the border. Um, so you know, maybe that's the reason why I became very interested in international economics. It's definitely daily uh, affected uh, my life being so close, uh, so close to the border. Uh, what I want to talk about today is um, uh, you know, what his research told us about winners and losers from uh, international trade in uh, low-income uh, countries. Uh, this, this is part of my research agenda, as well as research ag agenda of uh, a large set of researchers, both in the United States as, as well as worldwide. Uh, and what I want to do today is, uh, you know, um, uh, try to convince you that this is an important question to be uh, uh, asking and answering. Uh, then provide you a little bit of a glimpse into how do we go about doing this research. And third of all, give you a couple takeaways from this research. Uh, one on uh, kind of, uh, you know, trade and workers, and one actually uh, that relates to uh, the work that I've done uh, on child labor with, uh, with Eric. So let's start with, you know, why we should be interested in this research. Uh, the effects of international trade on the lives of uh, um, poor people in low-income countries um, uh, are extremely controversial issue uh, in public de uh, policy debates. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have a group of individuals um, who believe that uh, you know trade is a key contributor for declines in world uh, poverty, and this is um, this is the the uh, sense. Uh, uh, given by the quote from a recent issue of The Economist, uh, the, the, the argument that this group makes is that you know, trade, trade promotes growth, and we know that growth uh, reduces poverty. And uh, this idea is behind the policy prescriptions of institutions such as the World Bank and International Money, uh, Monetary Fund when they encourage uh, low-income countries who want to increase their living standards uh, to liberalize their trade policy. However, we also have uh, a group of um, a, a second group of individuals who believe that international trade actually perpetuates um, uh, poverty in low-income countries, and the reason why it does that is because it basically enables corporations to uh, exploit low-wage workers uh, in these uh, in these uh, countries. So. Uh, the second group uh, basically believes that trade contributes to the problem of poverty as opposed to uh, uh, cures poverty. Uh, a uh, different uh, argument that uh, an another group of people who uh, oppose uh, trade uh, provides is that basically trade, while it might uh, you know, benefit a country as a whole, harms some individuals in these countries. And um, those people that are hurt uh, as a result of international trade are going to uh, oppose uh, trade. Uh, so clearly this is a very divisive issue. What I want to mention is that even if you're in the uh, first group of people who uh, are, are uh, you know, believe that uh, you know, countries should be practicing uh, fairly free trade, and this is the group where a lot of the economists are in, you should still care about uh, you know, who are the winners and who are the losers from the international trade. And you know, why is that the case? Well, the reason for that is that if you have these beliefs, you actually believe that countries, uh, in order to grow, should be um, uh, practicing free trade uh, policies. However, to, uh, if a lot of people are harmed by international trade, they will be opposing uh, such policies, and you're going to have, uh, as a policymakers, you will have, uh, you will not have public support for uh, trade realization. And it's very important for policymakers uh, who are trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, prescribe free trade policy to also think about, uh, you know, what kind of pro programs can they uh, devise to share kind of the potential aggregate gains from international tape trade with those who also get harmed uh, by international uh, trade. So what's the role of research in this question? Um, well, I think the research has two roles. First of all, it, it should, um, uh, you know, it should provide uh, um, uh, policymakers uh, with, in a, uh, with a better idea of what are the mechanisms through which international trade uh, reallocates resources across individuals within a country. And second of all, it should help policymakers identify who benefits from trade and who uh, loses from trade. So what I want to do next is uh, give you a bit of a sense of how do, uh, you know, how do researchers go, go about figuring out the mechanisms through which 
the lives of individuals are um, affected by trade and also identifying winners uh, and losers. Uh, I want to start that discussion uh, by um, first giving you a sense of the world during the period uh, that I will be uh, focusing on. So this is, uh, this is basically a quick snapshot of living standards across uh, countries uh, in 1980. This is prior to most stabilizations that happened in low-income countries. So uh, on the x-axis here, uh, I have plotted cumulative population. So you see that India and China can account for uh, basically half of the population of the world. On the y-axis, uh, we have uh, basically a measure of living standards uh, across countries that's kind of that tries to be comparable across countries. And the countries are ranked by, uh, by, by this living standard. So you see up here we have rich countries like United States, here is Japan, Mexico, and down here we have countries like India and China where an average per, uh, where in 1980 an average person lived in extreme poverty. Well, so let's forward this uh, picture 30, year, uh, 30 years. So now we are in 2010. And uh, what I do on this picture, I basically, uh, again, take a measure of living standards that's comparable over time and across countries and plot it. Okay. And one thing that you can notice, especially if we focus on the bottom part of the graph, that a lot of the countries that were uh, extremely poor in the 1980s have grown quite a bit in this past 30 years. So for example, here is India, uh, which used to be down there. And here, uh, here is China, which used to be down there. So you see that in, you know, in, in this 30-year 30 uh, 30 period, when um, uh, you know, several um, low-income countries have uh, implemented more liberalized trade policy, uh, countries have definitely, uh, poor countries have definitely experienced quite a bit of growth. However, uh, you know, this picture can't really tell us, you know, first of all, how important uh, international trade was uh, uh, for this growth, and second of all, uh, what was happening within each country. Like this picture really just focuses on average uh, living standard, like for uh, living standard of an average person. So what I want to do, uh, what I want to uh, talk about is like, you know, what can research do to actually examine who within countries benefited from this trade policy changes? And how do we know that what we observe, you know, what we observe uh, in terms of how their earnings have uh, changed has really been caused by trade? Uh, so. Uh, so uh, the key problem with doing research in this area is that when international, uh, when people are exposed to international trade, they're exposed to trade in an environment where many other uh, uh, forces are also changes. You know, uh, te technology is changing, uh, educational systems are changing, other domestic policies are changing. So how do researchers tease out the effects of trade from all these other sources? Uh, uh, well, uh, one, uh, you know, a key component of research work is that since 1980s, many countries have started collecting large-scale uh, nationally representative data sets that include uh, a, a ton of information on individuals and uh, households. Uh, and uh, oftentimes these surveys actually cover periods before during and after uh, trade policy change. And these this surveys basically provide a window into the lives of uh, individuals. We know uh, whether, you know, what do they do? Do they work? Uh, uh, if they work, how much do they earn? How many hours per week do they work? Uh, we also know uh, individuals' characteristics, you know, how educated they are. Uh, um, you know, how old are they? Are they women? Are they men? Uh, we also know what, if they work, what industry they work in. Um, we know uh, approximate location where they live. And in some of the more richer of these surveys, we actually even know what the family structure is, uh, you know, how many children they have, uh, um, uh, are they married, and so on. Uh, and in, in, in even richer of these surveys, we even know how they spend their household budgets, okay? So these surveys really enable us to basically follow, you know, to examine how do lives of individuals change uh, you know, uh, during traderization process. So how does trade change people's life? Okay. Uh, the second component that really helps us identify, uh, you know, uh, the effect of trade on individuals' lives from other factors is that research has focused on examining the consequences of large-scale trade policy changes that many uh, low-income countries have implemented in the past, uh, uh, past 30 years. And uh, the, I, I want to emphasize that these policy changes were uh, very large. Uh, and mo uh, a key component of these changes is that countries reduced uh, taxes on uh, foreign goods or, or, or imports. And 
Another key change was that this tariff changes varied quite a bit across products uh, and industries. And we, what we do in research is we try to uh, examine how, for example, individuals who were exposed to trade uh, you know, differently because they work in an industry, you know, some work in industries with large tariff cuts, others worked with industries uh, that experience small tariff cuts, you know, or like some live in regions that where there's a lot of industries subject that were protected prior to trade reform and others live in regions that uh, where there are very, uh, where uh, there were very few um, employment opportunities in protected um, uh, sectors. We, we use that to disentangle the effects of, uh, the effects of trades on the, on the life of the people. One thing we need to worry, uh, that we need to worry in, in, this, uh, in this research is we still, uh, in, in, in order to examine the causal effect of trade, is we need to use institutional details of trade realization episodes to establish causality you know, uh, between uh, trade policy and outcomes. Because, uh, so let me give you an example. And for example, uh, Emily uh, works, uh, Emily Blanchard at TAC works a lot on this. Uh, if people are going to be made worse off as a result of trade policy changes, they're going to lobby a lot for those trade uh, uh, tariff changes not uh, to happen. And uh, what we try, you know, if you think, uh, if you, um, one thing that excites me as a researcher is if I come across a trade policy change where industries were not able to do that. And a good example of that is uh, 2001 U.S. Vietnam bilateral trade agreement. What this trade agreement did. It basically lowered taxes on Vietnamese exports coming to the United States, and th the way, uh, and basically the way this happened is that uh, uh, there was really no negotiation. All that negotiator did is basically moved Vietnam from one pre-existing tariff schedule uh, in uh, U.S. harmonized uh, schedule of tariffs, uh, and those were tariffs determined during the uh, Great Depression, to another another pre-existing tariff schedule. Uh, w where, um, which was determined, uh, you know, years uh, prior to this agreement through the, uh, through the negotiations that the United States did uh, with other members of the WTO. Um, you know, this is clearly an example where uh, uh, industry um, uh, interests were not able to influence the trade policy changes. But, um, you know, that's, that's, from the perspective of research, that's pretty exciting because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, political economy of protection in this particular case. Okay. So um, uh, what we, uh, you know, what I talked about the data, I talked about, um, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, why it's important to focus on uh, examining consequences of trade policy changes. What we do then as economists is we basically use economic theory and predictions of this, uh, this theory to guide us uh, 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 through how can we use this trade policy change with the data to, uh, to examine the mechanisms through which um, uh, trade affects uh, individuals. Okay. So what I want to do next is uh, provide you with um, um, two uh, examples, uh, well, two areas in which uh, I have contributed some research on understanding who wins and who loses from international trade. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that I'm also going to be talking about research of um, other economists. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that I'm looking at a really small slice of this research. There's a, there's a lot of work, that, uh, great work that I, you know, I just don't have time to uh, discuss uh, during uh, a short uh, lecture. Okay. So uh, let me uh, talk about uh, one example of like which workers lose and gain from uh, international trade. And what I'll try to uh, convince you with a few examples that I'll give you uh, in a moment is that when we try to think about uh, which workers in a low income country are gonna be gaining from trade and which ones are gonna be losing, uh, what is key is uh, industry in which workers uh, work or location where they live. And in particular, uh, there are now uh, quite a few papers, uh, very carefully done, that basically show that uh, if you're a worker who before trade reform uh, works in an import competing industry, so uh, industry uh, that was prior to the reform shielded from foreign competition, or if you're a worker that lives in a region where uh, a lot of the industry that was protected prior to the reform uh, uh, is located, you're gonna be made more worse off as a result of these trade reforms. However, at least in the short run. However, if you're a worker who, um, who works in an export-oriented industry, or for that matter, even an exporting uh, uh, firm, and Andy Bernard has done a lot of work on exporting firms, uh, or if you work in a region where a lot of the exporting uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, industries that have exporting potential are located, 
you're going to be made better off as a result of, uh, uh, as a result of uh, uh, trade reform. And, when I wanna, and I want to show you this on uh, uh, three specific cases, uh, Colombia, India, and uh, Vietnam. So let me start with Colombian uh, trade liberalization, which I studied with uh, a co-author and a mentor of mine, uh, Penny Goldberg, who is at Yale. So uh, Colombia liberalized its trade policy in a large-scale uh, um, liberalization uh, from 1985 to 1991. Uh, to give you a sense of how large this trade liberalization was, what this graph shows you is uh, average tariff uh, from before uh, um, liberalization to the end of liberalization. And you see that on average, uh, taxes on imported goods drop by about 40 percentage points uh, in Colombia. And what I, what I want to emphasize is that underlying this average, there's a lot of variation in these tariff cuts across uh, industries. Uh, there were some industries that prior to liberalization had very large tariff cuts and some that had small ones. What the goal of the Colombian government mo was is to not only reduce the level, of every, uh, the level of tariffs, but also make tariffs much more uniform across industries. And as a result of that, uh, industries that initially had really large tariff cuts, uh, uh, had very large tariff levels, observed larger tariff cuts. And what uh, Penny and I did in our work is we basically took, uh, used uh, 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 worker level data, so uh, labor force surveys from urban Colombia from 1984 to 1998. We had annual data. We observed these workers uh, every year, kind of before, during, and after trade liberalization episode. And what we were trying to understand uh, was the following. Were workers that uh, worked in um, industries that had larger tariff cuts, did they experience different wage uh, ch changes in earnings and workers that were in industries that observed smaller tariff cuts or might not have even experienced any tariff cuts? So uh, what do we, uh, uh, you know, what would we expect to find? Well, uh, if we think of, you know, so let's, let's consider what a decline in uh, a tax on foreign goods is going to do in Colombia. Well, first of all, it's going to make foreign uh, consumers in Colombia uh, much better off because now they can buy this good that, they, uh, that had a high uh, price prior to liberalization, much cheaper from abroad. At the same time, uh, this good is also, uh, uh, because of competition, lowering the price of the domestic goods. So this is great news for consumers. However, not so good news for producers in, and workers in this industry because uh, since now the, your consumers actually have a choice, they can buy domestic goods or foreign produced goods, uh, which are often uh, perhaps even uh, you know, better produced and cheaper. Uh, the demand for, uh, for uh, domestic goods is going to decrease. And what that means, the demand for workers in these domestic industries is going to decrease as well. And that, what that implies is that with lower tariffs, there come lower wages in these industries. Okay? Uh, however, you might also say that, well, if workers you know, earn lower wages in one industry, can they just move to another industry? So it's an empirical question to actually check you know, how much were wages actually affected as a result of these tariff cuts. Uh, so what do, uh, what do Penny and I find? Uh, so our findings are kind of aggregated and summarized in this uh, picture. Uh, so uh, what this picture does, it uh, gives you uh, 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 it shows you effects on industry wages uh, um, as a result of tariff cuts in different, uh, in different Colombian industries. Well, let's look at uh, uh, kind of aggregate effects in the apparel industry. Well, apparel industry experienced about 73 percentage drop in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, tax, in foreign tax. That's a huge drop. Uh, what uh, our uh, research implies is that as a result of these drops, uh, a worker in apparel industry observed a 9% decline in industry wage relative to a worker uh, who would have exactly the same characteristics who would be working, who works in an industry that didn't experience a tariff change. Okay, so this is a pretty large effect. Well, let's take example of chemicals. Well, chemicals observed a 22 percentage point drop in tariffs. Uh, so since, uh, and uh, uh, the implied decline in industry wages was 3% relative to the workers in industries that didn't observe these tariff cuts. So what our, uh, for what our results show is that um, uh, in Colombia, uh, you know, uh, this uh, trade liberalization uh, made, uh, you know, made workers in import competing industries, at least in the, you know, the uh, several years after trade liberalization, uh, worse off through industry wages. So again, you might say, you know, if these workers actually now have lower uh, wages and wages in other industries are, uh, are higher, why don't they move? 
And uh, we can actually examine whether or not they move in our data. And we actually find, and if they would be moving, then we would be uh, expecting structure of uh, employment across industries to be changing a lot. But we actually find that that's not the case. And that's a bit of a puzzle. And uh, we actually did not have good data to explore that puzzle further. But one potential explanation why workers can't move across industry is that because maybe they have accumulated a lot of skills that are only good if they work in that one industry that was protective. If they move, uh, they cannot, they, those skills are actually uh, not that used. And as a result of that, they are, uh, they are somewhat stuck. So that's, uh, that's Colombia. Uh, let me focus on India. So India uh, uh, underwent a, ma a major trade liberalization in 1991. And uh, this trade liberalization was basically imposed on India uh, by International Monet for a Monetary Fund as part of, uh, uh, as par part of the uh, package, reform package that uh, bailed out, uh, that uh, uh, came as a response to uh, IMF bailing uh, out India uh, in a balance of payment uh, crisis. And Nancy works a lot on balance of payment uh, crisis. Uh, so, uh, again, from the econometric perspective, the nice thing about this uh, liberalization is that basically IMF told India that you need to uh, basically reduce uh, industry tariffs to a more uniform level. Okay, so again, there was not, at least in the several years after trade reform, there was not much ability of, uh, of domestic interest groups in India to lobby for different levels of protection. Uh, as you can see from this graph, India had very large uh, levels of uh, taxes on imports prior to liberalization. They dropped by 60 percentage point, but I want to point out they are still pretty high even after liberalization. They are about 30 percent. Um, okay. So an another nice thing about, about India's liberalization is that uh, India at the time of liberalization accounts for one third of world's poor. So if we are trying to understand you know, how does uh, uh, trade affect uh, poverty, this is a great uh, case to study. And uh, the author of this uh, study is uh, Petya Topalova, who actually is an IMF employee uh, right now, but at the time she was a MIT graduate student. Uh, so what, what does Petya do to examine how did trade affect poverty? Well, let's, so poverty, as I mentioned, poverty rates in India uh, were uh, high uh, prior to trade reform. So for example, in rural India, 37% of people live in, uh, in poverty. Well, after trade reform, poverty rates go down. For example, in rural India, only you know, now 24% people, uh, 24 of people live in poverty. However, how can you tell how much of this decline, uh, if any, was caused by trade? Because if I would actually give you a picture of India's poverty uh, rates over longer time, you would actually tell that if, you know, if I would be extending graph this way, poverty has been on decline. Okay, so what uh, Petya did in, in her research, she said, well, let, let's do the following. Uh, India is organized, uh, is divided into many, many districts, which are kind of administrative units, and they're actually also good examples of la labor markets in India. So, uh, and there are going to be some districts in India that prior to trade reform had many, um, uh, a lot of employment in protected sectors. On the other hand, there are going to be some districts that had very little employment in these protected sectors. So what she does is she says is like, well, let's compare how poverty uh, declined in, uh, uh, in districts that were very exposed to uh, trade liberalization because of their existing employment structure relative to those uh, where that were not so exposed. And so what does she find? So what she finds is that if you're a family that lives in a district that was more exposed to foreign competition, uh, you were now facing a labor market where wages, were, uh, wages in industry were lower, wages in agriculture were lower, and also you were much more, uh, your, your uh, uh, poverty increased relative to other districts. So again, what you see here is uh, uh, workers uh, or families and families that live in regions that uh, where more of the import competing industry is concentrated fared worse um, uh, as a result of trade liberalization. And again, you might be asking yourself, well, can't you, can these workers or families just move to areas that are benefiting from trade reform? Uh, well, one would think maybe they would, but it doesn't look like they can. Uh, mobility of workers across Indian districts for employment is extremely low. So what Petya finds is that uh, if you look in a window of 10 years before and after tribalization, uh, less than 1% of rural individuals move across district lines uh, for employment purposes. 
uh, migration out of urban area uh, in urban areas is a little bit higher, uh, uh, but yet less than 5% of individuals move for employment uh, 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 purposes. And what you actually find is that migration and population patterns across these districts appear to be um, unaffected by liberalization. So again, it seems like in Colombia, these individuals who are, uh, who are, you know, are uh, living in areas that get de uh, relatively depressed as a result of uh, trade, uh, they can't move out of this, uh, these areas um, to, uh, to places that have actually benefited from trade reform. Uh, well, let me end uh, uh, with a, a bit of a different example. You know, I'm coming back to, uh, to US-Vietnam bilateral trade agreement. So let's look at Vietnam. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Vietnam, um, um, uh, as a result of this agreement in 2001, um, suddenly uh, um, uh, was, uh, it became much cheaper for Vietnamese firms to export to the United States because the, kind of the main policy change that this agreement achieved kind of in the short run was to, for the United States to reduce import taxes on Vietnamese exports entering the United States. And again, the change in tax on average was very large. It went from 23% prior to, to the signing of the agreement to 2.4%. And uh, uh, what one can tell, if, uh, if kind of looking at the data on uh, trade data, this was this led to a, a huge surge in uh, uh, exports to the United States. And within three years, United States accounted for uh, uh, you know on average 20% of uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, exports and 25% of Vietnamese uh, exports uh, in manufacturing. Okay, so let's, uh, so, you know, what, how did this affect uh, uh, you know, Vietnamese workers? What this study does, and this, this is a study uh, by Brian McKegg, who is at Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, this study actually does something very similar to the Indian study. Uh, again, uh, the study says, well, Vietnam uh, is consi consists of many, many provinces. Uh, Industry structure prior to trade reform in some of these pro provinces is geared very much toward industries that, uh, uh, ben uh, that are likely to benefit from, this uh, from these tariff cuts uh, on exports. Uh, you know, and this would be areas around Hanoi, uh, uh, areas around Ho Chi Minh City, and so on. Uh, however, there are other areas that, uh, uh, you know, that are not really going to be affected uh, by export opportunities because they just don't have uh, many uh, people prior to the reform employed in these industries. Uh, so what does this study find? It, fi well, it finds that if you live in a, uh, in a province with, uh, that, uh, because of, uh, uh, because of uh, exporting becoming cheaper into the United States, uh, you were facing a labor market that observed an increase in wages. And what's interesting here is that actually wages of uh, less educated workers actually increased more than wages of skilled workers. And also, you, uh, you also observed bigger, uh, bigger declines in poverty. So what this example here illustrates is that when, uh, you know, if you are uh, exposed, if you are uh, exposed to trade, um, you know, in an export-oriented industry or an area that's um, specializing in export-oriented industries, trade actually makes you better off. Okay. So what are the take, you know, what are the takeaways? Which I uh, started with is that when we are trying to understand who are the winners and losers from international trade in low-income countries. Um, Industry and locations, at least in the short run, uh, play uh, play uh, uh, a very uh, a very large uh, role. Uh, the, the, the other takeaway is that um, uh, what's very uh, what becomes very apparent from m much of this data is that. If you start off in an, uh, in an industry that, uh, uh, that uh, was import competing or in an area that was uh, negatively affected by, uh, by trade liberalization, you have really hard time moving out of that area, even you know, in periods up to 10 years after trade, uh, trade reform. Okay? So even though trade provides opportunities in your country in some other areas, you just can't share in those opportunities. Okay, um, I want to spend, what I want to do uh, uh, as last part of the lecture, I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about how these changes in incomes that families have experienced uh, have experienced um, as a result of trade reform affect uh, uh, their investments in school education. Kind of going back to uh, uh, to my research that uh, uh, President Hanlon mentioned uh, in the uh, in, in the. Uh, Introduction and the reason why this is important is because uh, it shows that even though you know while these winners and losers from international trade might be 
uh, you know, uh, temporary because maybe over the long run, everybody's going to benefit from uh, uh, to the, uh, from um, uh, higher growth to the extent that uh, trade uh, leads to uh, more growth. Uh, nonetheless, for, for some of the families, this might have longer term consequences by affecting education of uh, uh, their children. So before, before I go into the details of those studies, what I want to do is just give you a bit of a background on, on uh, child labor in, uh, in uh, low, uh, uh, low income uh, countries. So uh, worldwide uh, right now, uh, about uh, uh, 2 million, uh, 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 no, uh, 264 million uh, children uh, work. And that accounts for about almost 17% of, uh, uh, of children. Uh, and you know, as consumers uh, in rich countries who often buy goods that uh, were produced by countries where child labor is pretty le prevalent, we might wonder, you know, are we by, you know, by buying these goods, are we actually perpetuating uh, uh, child labor? So uh, what, uh, we, what, what I'm going to try to, uh, what I'm going to discuss is, you know, is there a role for trade policy to influence uh, the prevalence of, uh, of, uh, of child employment? Uh, before I get into that, uh, uh, into the details though, let me just highlight where do most children uh, work. So usually uh, we have um, the, the image of a child worker uh, from low income countries. Uh, uh, the usual one is of a worker working in a, uh, of a child working in a manufacturing uh, sweatshop. Okay? However, most children, uh, almost 70%, uh, work hand in hand with their p parents in, 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 in unpaid family work. That can be uh, f family farms. Uh, it can be in, uh, taking care of their younger siblings. Uh, they, can, can, they can be fetching wo uh, wood or uh, fetching wor worker, feeding, uh, um, feeding livestock, and so on. Uh, only 22% of uh, employment is uh, in paid employment, and 8% uh, uh, is um, actually self-employment. And Ella, if you're wondering what your babysitting services would uh, count as, you, pr you would be uh, self-employed, and your employer is also in the audience. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the other thing that I want to mention is that uh, most, you know, uh, most children do not work in, agri uh, in manufacturing. Uh, the majority of children are employed in agriculture. Almost 60% 60, 60 of children in work work in agriculture. Only 7% do uh, in, uh, in manufacturing. So keep these uh, numbers uh, in mind uh, as, I go through the, uh, as, as I go through the next examples. So uh, what, I wanna, what I wanna ask now is, well, how should we think about the link between uh, international trade and child labor? Uh, you know, how does trade affect, uh, uh, how, how does trade affect uh, uh, family's decision to uh, either send uh, a child to a school or send them uh, to work? Uh, so consider, Consider, uh, um, you know, consider a setting, because this is, this is re uh, most relevant from policy perspective, that you, you're a family producing, let's say, rice or some, some good that your country uh, has, compar you know, uh, has comparative advantages, so it exports. And suddenly, the demand for the good that you're producing in uh, produces increases on the world market. Okay, so what that means is that the price at which you're going to be able to sell the good that you're producing is going to increase, and this is going to increase your, uh, your uh, family income. So let's think about you know, how, does, how do these increased export opportunities affect families' decision uh, whether or not to send child to work or, uh, or, uh, or uh, send them to school. Okay, well, so they're going to be, trade is going to be uh, uh, having two, uh, this export opportunity is going to have two effects. The first one will be this, uh, this effect on family income. So because now the good that you're producing has just become more expensive, you, you, will, you earn more, so your in income goes up. And uh, to the extent that uh, you know, children are working because you feel that they need to, uh, that, that you need their economic contribution in order to survive, there's less of a need for you to now have children working. So what this would imply is that with higher uh, uh, family income, child labor should decrease as a result of trade. However, there's this opposing uh, effect that operates through employment opportunities for children. Well now, this sector that's being, uh, uh, that produces the good that's being exporting is, is booming, so wages are higher, there are more employment opportunities. 
or even if the child is working with you on the family farm, there's probably more, you know, there's probably more work. So uh, at the same time, uh, what this implies is that the demand for child, uh, for child um, services also goes up. And uh, because of that, wages uh, are higher. Uh, so uh, it's more lucrative for children to work. So that would actually lead to um, increases in child labor. So the big question from the perspective of research is, well, which of these two effects dominates? And what Eric and I did, uh, um, I guess almost 10 years ago, uh, is uh, we basically used a policy experiment from Vietnam to ask this question. So, what, uh, so Vietnam, prior to uh, early 90s, actually imposed restrictions on how much rice uh, families were able to exp uh, a country was able to uh, export. In the, um, and this de uh, depressed the price of rice uh, in Vietnam. Um, uh, in the mid 90s, it relaxed this uh, export, uh, uh, this export restriction. So all of a sudden, uh, the price of rice in Vietnam uh, went up, and these price changes differed quite a bit across provinces of Vietnam, depending on how integrated they were uh, into the uh, into the rice markets. So uh, what do, what do Eric and I do? Well, we actually have household level surveys from before the rice export quota change and after, and actually ob we observed the same households before and after. In this house, this survey contain a ton of information on uh, uh, you know whether or not um, household is a rice producer uh, and also you know uh, characteristics of the household and also uh, activities of, of children okay and to give you a sense of uh, of Vietnam at that time uh, I want to mention is that at that time 60% of children in Vietnam ages 6 to 15 work 26% uh, work directly in rice cultivation and uh, th the other thing to keep in mind is that 70% of Vietnamese households actually produce rice. So, you know, this rice uh, quota elimination really has potential to benefit the incomes of many uh, households. So what do we find? Well, over the uh, period of our study, child labor in Vietnam declined by 2.2 million. And what we find is just a little bit less than a half of this decline can be attributed to price change, rice price changes that happen uh, as, a result of, uh, uh, as a result of quota elimination. So what this suggests is that uh, uh, you know, uh, the effects of trade through family, by, uh, through family income channel dominated the growing demand for uh, ch uh, ch child labor uh, services. Um, and you know, uh, in, in Vietnam, this actually had large consequences because many families were involved in rice uh, price, uh, rice production, because land was pretty equitably uh, distributed distributed across these uh, families. So in this case. Uh, 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 trade actually led to reductions in child labor. And what this case also illustrates that, you know, uh, a key uh, factor through which trade is going to be affecting child labor is going to be through family income. And we actually find support for uh, importance of uh, um, effects of trade on schooling and uh, child labor decision through family income in the case of India. So. Think of, so we basically, with uh, a co-author, Petya Topalova, who was, uh, we actually examined the relationship between um, trade and schooling and child labor in the case of Indian traderization that I talked about uh, uh, earlier. Keep in mind that in that case, Indian families actually experienced a negative income shock as a result of uh, trade, unlike in Vietnam, where families experienced positive income shock. So what do we find here is that, well, in those areas that were more negatively affected by uh, this um, uh, 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 policy change, uh, we actually observed declines in schooling and actually also declines in literacy. And these declines are particularly pronounced for girls. Okay? But again, kind of the underlying mechanism through which trade affects child labor and schooling is the same as in the case in Vietnam. We are just looking at two different types of policy shocks. So, uh, you know, to conclude, uh, you know, uh, I started this uh, part of my talk, is there a role uh, for policy to influence the prevalence of child labor? Uh, well, it seems that the main channel through which trade policy um, uh, in, in these studies affects a family, uh, uh, child labor is through affecting uh, family uh, incomes. So, you know, if you're, if you're a country who's thinking uh, of uh, using trade sanction vis-a-vis -a, -vis a low income country to uh, eliminate child labor, uh, uh, in, in that low-income country, what you should be uh, asking yourself in terms of whether or not that tool is going to be uh, effective is whether, you know, how is that trade sanction going to be affecting, uh, uh, affecting the, family, uh, if the family incomes there. If it actually leads to declines in family incomes, 
that's going to actually increase poverty and potentially even uh, uh, further endanger uh, uh, endanger ch children who uh, would would continue to work, uh, but perhaps in some other uh, uh, some other uh, sectors. So let me uh, let me conclude. Uh, so uh, what I try to do in this lecture is give you a bit of uh, you know a bit of a glimpse into uh, the research uh, on uh, who are the winners and losers from international trade. And uh, what um, I, I showed is that uh, it seems that trade benefits workers who uh, work in export-oriented industries and regions. On the other hand, uh, it actually harms workers who work in income comp competing industries, uh, at least kinda, at least in the uh, in short run after trade transition episode. And this actually has consequences for uh, for their children. Uh, so if we kind of go back to the uh, to uh, the uh, introduction for, uh, and think about the um, you know the group of uh, the, about the um, arguments that uh, uh, people may why tr uh, why trade might perpetuate poverty uh, in low-income countries, a lot of those arguments are focused on uh, you know corporations uh, taking advantage of low-wage workers uh, in exporting industries. And you know what, what this study suggests is that we have to be a little bit careful about that interpretation. It might be that those corporations are not, you know, de they are definitely not paying the same wages to these workers that they would to a worker in a developed country. Also, the working conditions are not as good as they would be in, you know, in the same company in a de developed country. However, uh, these low-income individuals, uh, you know, uh, cannot work in these other developed countries. You know, uh, what we have to be asking: Well, what would the, these workers in export-oriented industries be doing in the absence of trade? And what the research, especially the research in Vietnam, suggests from the Vietnam suggests is that, uh, you know, in the absence of trade, these workers were actually uh, worse off. And these jobs, while they might not look great to us, are actually potentially better jobs than what was available to these workers prior to prior to the trade. You know, who should we really be worried as a result of uh, as losers of international trade? Well, those are these are workers like uh, some Indian farmers who are made worse off as a result of international trade because they are uh, they are working in import import competing industries. Those are the workers who are made worse off. And those also appear to be workers who have really, really hard time moving out of the areas negatively affected by trade toward areas uh, with, uh, where, con where trade has given economic opportunities. So thank you very much for listening. And again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my research. Thanks. <laughs> Because on the one on the one hand, 
we do, you know, we do have some power to affect uh, uh, affect living, uh, you know, kind of labor standards in uh, low-income countries because, for example, in Vietnam, we lack, you know, with 20% or of manufacturing, 25% of manufacturing exports go to the United States. You remember the United States has some power over like what Vietnam can do. However, what we have to keep in mind, uh, uh, and you know, and actually there is some evidence uh, from Indonesia that Ann Harrison has provided that actually shows that when uh, when uh, uh, just kind of protesters uh, kind of uh, I, you know kind of show kind of show the, what the uh, what the working conditions were in some of these manufacturing um, factories, which we call sweatshop, you know, just public scrutiny forced companies like Nike and Adidas and so on to actually raise some wages and improve working conditions. So I think by focusing on these issues, we do uh, we do uh, we do uh, focus public's attention on this issue, and it's in companies' interest if they want to continue, you know, if they want to uh, protect their brands to actually, in, in, you know, to improve uh, the conditions and perhaps share kind of the share of, um, part of their profits more with these workers. However. On, on the other hand, if uh, you know, if we impose really stark standards, well, what can actually happen? You know, what can happen is that uh, you know maybe some of these corporations, the wages are, or standards are going to be so high that maybe corporations are going to find another country where wages uh, where wages are lower. So I think I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn on. on, on. Yeah. And actually, actually, the final thing that I want to say is like we actually have. You know, we have evidence from uh, China, especially, is that you know, if, if you are if you are a good uh, if you're a location where that is actually uh, quite lucrative for corporations to uh, to, uh, to produce uh, produce uh, goods in low-income countries, many other corporations are going to find that location lucrative. And what's going to happen over time that as more and more companies come in, they're going to be you know they're going to be competing for the same workers, and, and and especially in these countries, the share the pool of uh, workers, even with primary education, is actually not as high. You know, complete primary education is not as high as uh, as uh, one would think. So that actually builds up uh, wages. So you know, that's another you know kind of case to be made that maybe you know, we should just kind of keep things uh, as they are because uh, you know this is an attractive location uh, for many corporations. Uh, ultimately, wages get. Uh, yeah. How do we translate these findings into the welfare of the <laughs> That's actually the, the experts on World Trade Organization is Bob Steger, so I, I, I'm not going to call him. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> <laughs> a tough question. Yeah. Just... No, I mean, I, I mean the, the way I so basically I think uh, I think well, first of all, I want to emphasize that the World Trade Organization, until the recent round, actually had quite a bit of success. Uh, so, in, you know, after the Uruguay round, uh, it, it managed to really lower uh, import tariffs initially among developed countries. Then, in the, in the, during the Uruguay round, also during the, for the developing countries. Sure. And but also the, the Doha round has failed. Right? Th yeah, it has failed. And I think like that, two things that are different in the Doha round. First of all, uh, developing countries for the first time are actually uh, uh, they kind of almost have like an equal position at the bargaining table. So I think they are inserting their own interests. Uh, in power vis-a-vis -vis the developed countries, which usually uh, dictated the negotiation rounds. So I think that makes it trickier for uh, for negotiations. And uh, second of all, I think agricultural is just very tricky uh, area because there are a lot of there's a lot of domestic support for agriculture, and a lot of the policies that you're trying to eliminate are not really trade policies; they're actually domestic policies. So people are people are much more sensitive how this is encroaching on sovereignty of, on con of countries. Uh, uh, on you know on these issues of like you know can I actually provide a production subsidy uh, or have uh, or, or have um, uh, rules about um, uh, kind of safety food standards and so on because those, those are more those are not viewed necessarily as international policy issues they're more, they, you know historically they've been more domestic policy issues but uh, Bob, <laughs> uh, yes you talked about the beneficial effect on children's school. How significant is this effect? And where do the countries end up? Are there are there twenty percent of children going to school in Vietnam? Eighty percent going to school in Vietnam? Yeah. And what percentage or what percentile was was it changed? Yeah, so I like so for example, in like so actually in Vietnam, uh, the, the, um, the school participation even at the time of the the of the uh, study was actually uh, uh, 
of uh, is actually fairly high. In India, it was lower, but I actually I forget. Eric, do you remember the uh, actual estimates? Uh, no. I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's a lot to keep in terms of the Yes. The, uh, the uh, low worker mobility is uh, a worry, and but not surprising necessarily. You have families in the area. You have um, your support network. You difficult to move. Uh, do you have a sense of the time scale over which mobility, work and mobility would catch up with opportunity? Is, is yes. it the next generation? Yeah. You know, th th this is an excellent question. I think a lot, I think the next steps in this future, and there's already some ongoing work on this, is, you know, when do, do, do people, like, you know, this, for example, Indian study kind of was going up to like almost 10 years after the, the trade reform. It seems like people still didn't move. Uh, there's some, you know, one of the questions is like, why don't people move? And this is even the case in the United States where we think worker mobility would be even higher. And some, you know, some possibilities are that, you know, family, you know, especially if, especially if you're in a low income country or if you're poor, even in a country like the United States, you rely on family as a social safety net and for, you know, taking care of children uh, while you work and so on. So that keeps you stranded in a, in a place. Uh, it, in, a, in a place like India, all the uh, people believe the mobility is also low because of the caste system. Again, because we rely on caste system for uh, social uh, insurance. Uh, uh, or, or it might be that like, for existing workers, you know, you're never really going to be able to take advantage of opportunities in the export-oriented industry because the skills that you have acquired and education you have is just not compatible with what the uh, expanding sectors need. So for those, maybe the horizon is never. And with some, some of the work that I've been recently doing on Vietnam, what it suggests is that uh, you know, there, is, there is mobility, but it mainly happens uh, for younger people and more likely to happen for, uh, for educated people. If you're a worker above 35, you don't move that much. So I think it, 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 you know, a big part of it is actually uh, uh, is sexual uh, uh, generational as well. But that, that's a great question. I think we are, there's a lot of research <coughs> going on. on uh -huh. Yeah, so one more question. So why do I take a question from this, maybe, student? Uh, so I just have a question about metrics and specifically surrounding how we measure poverty. So that's the slides about India and how in 1980, 36% of the population was in poverty in cities, specifically in cities, versus 2010, when 24% were in poverty. Did you account for the dramatic increase in population? Yeah, so basically, so what those, uh, what those uh, poverty rates were basically headcount ratios. So basically told you what share of the population was living, uh, was living under pow poverty. So it's, a rel so, it's a rel so it's a relevant measure. I, you know, people oftentimes don't like that poverty measure because they say it basically just counts people below and above poverty line. And the line, poverty line used in those computations was the official Indian poverty line. Uh, even if you look at uh, you know better measures such as poverty gap, poverty has uh, has decreased. And that measure actually takes into account how far away from the poverty line uh, uh, poverty line uh, uh, you are. Yeah. And did the measure for poverty, specifically the poverty line, did that official measure change over time? Did the government make adjustments according to potential? Yeah. So so you so usually what happens with poverty lines as you get richer, they actually go up. Okay. So. Uh, Again, uh, thank you all for joining. I would like to invite everyone to come to the Kim Gallery to for reception and to continue the conversation. And let's thank Professor Pachnik one more.